My name is Teresa. I'm a wife, I'm a mom, but then also uh, I've been an architect for 22 years. When I first graduated from college, one of the things I wanted was to become a registered architect as quickly as possible. I wanted to be a partner in the firm. I was pursuing it with everything I had to the point where even it caused arguments at home. I wanted to kind of hit the peak of that profession. And it was almost like a switch that flipped when I had our first child and I realized, no way. That isn't the pinnacle. That isn't even necessarily what I want anymore. I want to be here. I want to be there when they're taking their first steps, and I want to be the one who holds them, and I want to be the one who feeds them. I was fortunate in that I had the opportunity to still work part-time, but mostly from home. Even though I've been back at work for a year, I feel like I'm constantly evaluating the balance of do the kids have enough of my time and attention? And am I setting clear boundaries at work in order to not have that impose on what I know my family needs? When I'm alone, I ask myself, you know, or even talk to God about, you know, why am I here? Like, what is the purpose? Is this where you want me? How long are you gonna want me to be here? I want to do whatever God wants me to do. What do you want? That's the question. Well, I guess what I want to know is I'm going to go ask Zeke and Eliana whose mommy is mad at first. That's going to be my first question. No, but uh, we've been, we're continuing a series on how to get what you really want in 2023. The question is, what do you want? There's going to be two parts to the message here today. The first part is I'm going to help you think through what do you really want in life? What do you really want? And then secondly, I'm going to help you realize that what you really want in life is actually, I think it's going to be the same thing that God wants for you. And that ultimately, that you can trust God. So what do you want? It's a, it's a tricky question, right? Because we've all gotten what we thought we wanted, only to find out a little bit later on that that's actually not what I wanted. Some, some of you got a who you wanted, only to realize that a little bit later on, that that's not actually not what I want either. Three months down the road, six months down the road, 48 car payments later, you realize that's actually not what I really, really wanted. The better question to ask is, what do I value? Or what, what is most important? You see, we'll never get what we really want until we discover what we really value. We'll never get what we really want until we ultimately discover what we really value. You see, there's, there's two problems with that. The first is that we don't only spend the time to think about what we really value, do we? Because that takes time, it takes effort. We live in this world that is, that is busy and hectic, and this takes time to sit down and think through. The second problem is, and we've been talking about this, is that what we naturally want is often in conflict with what we ultimately value. I, ultimately, I wanna be skinny, but I also wanna go eat chocolate and ice cream, right? I naturally want to do that, but what I ultimately value is different from that. See, James, the brother of Jesus, whenever he was talking about temptation, he, he said this, do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. And then Paul summed it up like this. We read this version last week. I loved it. He says, for I fail to practice the good deeds I desire to do, but the evil deeds I desire, to, uh, uh, but the evil deeds that I do not desire to do are what I am to ever doing if this is if this is you can you will you raise your hand okay all of you that didn't raise your hand you're all liars don't lie in church don't do that <laughs> unfortunately for most of us we just don't spend the time to figure out what do we ultimately value so how do we discover what we ultimately value how do we discover what is most important to us well i've i've uh, had some friends do this i've i've um, talked to some people and they um, shared the exercise that they did. And so I want to share this exercise with you on how they did it, because I think it is important for you in your lifetime. They did it from an exercise that came from the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Have you guys ever heard of that book? Um, it's a great book. It's one that I highly suggest that you read. So I'm going to read an excerpt from The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. 
There was the exercise that my friends went through to determine what was ultimately the most important thing for them in their life. So I just want to, I want you to spend a moment, maybe close your eyes if you need to, but just picture this in your mind, in your mind's eye. See yourself going to the funeral of a loved one. Picture yourself driving to the funeral chapel and getting out. As you walk inside the building, you notice the flowers, the soft organ music. You see the faces of the friends and family you passed around the way. You feel the shared sorrow of losing, the joy of having known that radiates from the hearts of the people there. As you walk down to the front of the room and you look inside the casket, you suddenly come face to face with yourself. This is your funeral three years from today. All these people have come to, your, to honor you and express love and appreciation for your life. As you take a seat and wait for the services to begin, you look at the program in your hand. There are to be four speakers on the day. The first is from your family, immediate and also extended children, brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents who have come from all over the country to attend. The second speaker is one of your friends, someone who can give a sense of who you are as a person. The third speaker is from your work or your profession. And the fourth is from your church community where you've been involved in service. Now, think deeply. What would you like each of these speakers to say about you and your life? What kind of husband, wife, father, or mother would you like their words to reflect? What kind of son or daughter or cousin? What kind of friend? What kind of work associate? What kind of character would you like for them to have seen in you? What achievements or contributions would you want them to remember? Look carefully at the people around you. What differences would you have liked to have made in their lives? Then he said, before you read further, take a few minutes to jot down your impressions. Now, now I like to read, and whenever I come to the point in the book that says, you know, pause for a second, I don't want you to do this. What do I do? I don't do it. I skip right past it and I keep going because what's the purpose of reading a book? To finish a book, right? You want to finish the book and say, yeah, I've read that book. That was a great book. You haven't read that yet? Oh yeah, it's amazing. I read that like two years ago, right? It's a great book. But you need to know the answer to that question. What is most valuable? What is most important in your life? What do you want your wife or your husband to say about you? at a funeral, your son, your daughter, a best friend, a coworker. Stephen Covey said this, if you carefully consider what you wanted, there's our word again, wanted, to be said of you in the funeral experience, you will find your definition of success. Another way of saying that is you will find what is most valuable to you. Now, as I, as I went through this process and I began to write down and think of the things that were really most valuable, what I wanted people to say about me I was shocked to find that my definition of success had virtually nothing to do with my achievements and virtually nothing to do with what I had in my life, but it had everything to do with my character and how I treated other people. See, when I got through this exercise, nobody got up and spoke about the nice car that I drove. Nobody got up and spoke about the nice house that I lived in. Nobody spoke about all my accomplishments None of that came up. Now, don't get me wrong. I love progress. You know, if, if you know me, my wife knows me, I judge how good of a day has been by what I got done in the day, right? I love progress. But in this exercise, when I was at the end of my life, I wanted people to get up and not talk about what I accomplished. I wanted them to get up and talk about who I was as a person. What I discovered was that it wasn't my accomplishments that matter. It was what my character is what was most important to me. So today I'm gonna to give you an example of one of mine, but I'm not gonna tell you all of them because I want you to go and do this process for yourself. And we'll do this a little bit later on in the service as well. I'll give you a few minutes to be able to begin this process of thinking through it. But whenever I sat down and thought through this, one of the things that I wanted for people to say about me when I was um, dead and gone, is that I wanted them to say that Jeremy was an honest person, that Jeremy had integrity, that if, if, if Jeremy said a yes, it was a yes, and if it was a no, it was a no. And if Jeremy said he was gonna go and do something, well then he was going to go and do it. 
And if he didn't do it, he was going to come tell you that he didn't do it. And he was going to come tell you before someone else told you. And you found out from someone else. Honesty, integrity was something that I valued. So I want you to spend some time this week to figure out what is most important to you. What do you value the most? To get what you really want, you must discover what you really value. And unless you do this, unless you spend some time on sitting down and thinking about what you really want to, it's very, very unlikely that you will ever accidentally stumble upon this in your daily life. You need to spend some time to do this. Now, this has been really helpful, right? This has been really good advice. But as Christians, we should be thinking about another question as well. Now, this is the second part of the message. Here's the question. What does God really want? We can figure out what we want, but more importantly, what does God want? Now, if you've grown up in the church or maybe you've had a, a bad experience in church at some point, maybe like Jeremy, Jeremy, it's not what, what does God want? It is what does God want from us? What does God want from us? And if you think that's the real question, let me, let me just, let me just, um, let me share something with you. Let me actually ask, ask you a question. When Jesus was going around and he was teaching us how to pray, do you remember the first two words that he said when he taught us how to pray? Does anyone remember? Our Father, our Father. That is right. Those are the first two words. Now, this is so important because if you can remember that Jesus invites us to address God as our Father, it clears up so much confusion. And the reason I say this is because of this. What, what does a good parent want from their children? What does a good parent want from their children? The answer? The answer is nothing. A good parent doesn't want anything from their children. A good parent wants something for their children. A good parent wants something for their children. See, in parenting, for takes precedence over from. And seeing your heavenly father, my heavenly father, your heavenly father wants something for you. He doesn't want something from you. And you see, we, we assume that there's this uh, competing agenda that what I want is different from what God wants. We assume that. And, and here's what I would say is that what you want naturally, like I want a Ferrari. You know, I want some, I want, maybe there's some things that I really want. What we want naturally, that may sometimes be at odds with what God wants for you. But what we discovered is that most of the time, what you want naturally is often at odds with what you want ultimately. So we need to figure out what does God want for us? What does God want for us? You see, this, this whole idea of serenity, surrendering to God is so scary because if we're honest, I think we think that we, we know better. If I can think back to my teenage years and um, thinking through situations, and I think whenever I wanted to go to a party and my mom and dad were like, no, who's going to that party? No, you cannot go to that party. And like, I thought to myself, mom, you're my dad. You just guys, you guys are so old fashioned. You don't get it. You're not with the times. And then what happens when you get a little bit older, right? You get older and you realize, uh, yeah. actually what they were talking about actually is, is, was wise. That probably was not the best thing for me to do. See, when you, when you read the New Testament and you listen to how Jesus talked about his heavenly father and your heavenly father, everything changes. And then when you go through this exercise that we talked about at the beginning, you realize that what you want for yourself is actually very closely tied, if not the exact same thing that your heavenly father wants for you. So here's a great question. What does God really want for you? What does God really want for you? Well, the apostle Paul, he does tell us. He says, if God would have his way in your life, if you would get in sync with your heavenly father, if you would get in step in a daily relationship with your father, here is what God wants for you. Paul tells us, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace. And I know that some of you are out there saying, Jeremy, Jeremy, I don't want love, joy, and peace. I want a Ferrari. I don't want love, joy, and peace. Jeremy, I don't want that. I want her. Or Jeremy, I don't want love, joy, and peace. I want him. I don't want love, joy, and peace. But here's the thing. Love, joy, and peace 
wouldn't those three things solve just about every problem that you have in your life? Now, if you were able to love the unlovable, if you're able to forgive someone that has hurt you so badly, if you're able to love unconditionally, wouldn't that solve a lot of your problems? What about joy? Have you ever seen someone with joy? It seems like they're just, they just come into the room and, and you know their story and things are falling apart. You know, their job is, is, is a mess. Their kids are a mess. Finances are not great. But it seems like they have just ignored all of that and they just have this peace and joy in their life. And you're like, what is that? What is going on with them? You see, that, that is the product of someone who is going in step with Jesus. It's like they have this contentment, this joy in the midst of their surroundings. And what about peace? Peace. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. There are many people that get their peace from a prescription, right? It's not natural. You can't work it up. You can't find it. But your heavenly father wants something for you. Your heavenly father wants this. It's this contentment. It's this internal sense of satisfaction that is somehow disconnected, but it doesn't put you in denial of what's happening around you. It's peace. You see, when you discover what you really want, when you discover what you really value, what you're going to discover is that God really wants the same things for yourself. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When, when you get behind all the things that you want, when you get behind all the things that you think you want, all the stuff and the money, you discover that these are the things, these are the things that you really want. These are the drivers that show up time and time again. And Paul, he, he continues on, he's, he's speaking to the church at Galatia, he says this, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, this is so powerful because when I look back to Jesus and as he was gathering his early disciples, what did he say to them? Well, he, he didn't say, obey me. He didn't say, do what I say. He didn't say, submit to me. What did he say? It was an invitation. It was the follow. It was the follow me. And, and I think some of his disciples, were, some of the people around him would be like, but Jesus, where are we going? Just follow. Jesus, look, I'm a planner, Jesus. I'm a planner, and I need to know where we're going. I think Jesus would say, just follow. And if I were to ask our Heavenly Father, where are we going? I believe he would say that we're going to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That's where we're going. That's where we're headed. And you see, I know that's where you want to go as well. And how do I know this? Well, I know this because that's the type of people that you're looking to surround yourself with. You're looking to surround yourself with people that have those characters. You're looking that your son is going to marry someone with those characteristics. You're looking, you're hoping that your daughter is going to marry someone with those characteristics. That's where you want to go. And you need to pay attention to these values because these values are always lurking in the shadows. These aren't always obvious. You have to spend the time to figure these out. So what do you want? You see, if you keep digging into that question, what do you want? Keep digging and digging and get behind all the stuff. You get behind all the experiences. You get behind all the money. You keep digging and digging, and eventually you get to things like meaning. You get to things like purpose. You get to things like legacy. And eventually, if you keep digging and digging a little bit more, you get face to face with the will of God for your life. You see, I believe what you really want and what God really wants for you, I believe they're the same thing. You see, and that's why, that's why you can trust God. That's why you can trust God. You can trust that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. You can trust that God is going to be the same that he was yesterday, that he is today, 
and what he's going to be in the future. See what happens when you trust God. Your faith grows, right? Your faith grows and you get to experience God in a way that you've never experienced before. It's knowledge on another level. Knowledge is great. It informs of, as, of who our enemy is and how to fight them. Experience is knowledge on another level. I heard a funny explanation of this recently. I can know what a kiss is. It's two mouths coming together to exchange a little bit of tongue and saliva. That doesn't sound great, right? <laughs> but then guess what? You experience it. Guess what? It brings it to a whole nother level, doesn't it? Right, baby? Yeah. <laughs> experience is another level. And I want you to experience God. I, just want, I don't want you to just know God. I want you to experience God. That's what we want for you here at Mosaic. That's why we always say we want you to experience God. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is power. It tells us, again, it tells us about our opponent and how to fight them. But experience is knowledge on another level. I want you to experience God in a daily relationship. And you're walking with him. And you're step by step with God. You're building relationship with him. You will find that you can trust God. You can find that God wants good things for you. You're going to find that the same things that you want is what God wants for you. And God is just inviting you. He's inviting you to follow. He's inviting you to follow. And again, where is he asking, where is he going to take you? Where is God going to take you? It's going to take you to love. It's going to take you to joy. It's going to take you to peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can trust God. If you're here today, you're like, Jeremy, that, I, that sounds great. I want to follow because my life is a mess. I've tried to do it by myself. I've tried to do it on my own, and it's just not working. I want to try it out. I want to follow Jesus. If you'll just bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute, if you, if you say that, if you're like, my, my life is a mess, I can't do it on my own. I want to try this. I don't know who this Jesus is. I don't know exactly what he's all about. But if he's going to take me to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, I want to go there. If you'll just raise your hand, I'd love to have a conversation with you. I'd love to have uh, just a, a conversation of who Jesus is and, and what he wants for your life and how you can get to know him more. Because he can be trusted. He wants you. So he wants a relationship with you so bad. So bad that he sent his son Jesus to come to live on this earth, to live a perfect life and to die on the cross for my sin, for your sin. He paid the ultimate penalty for, for me. He paid the ultimate penalty for you to have a relationship with you. And he wants to take you someplace good. He wants to take you to love, joy, peace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for your son. Thank you that um, you have good plans for us, that you, you want us to go in a, in a way that's where we'll experience you, we'll experience more love, we'll experience more joy, we'll experience more peace, more self-control, gentleness, faithfulness, God. Thank you for loving us that much, despite all of our failures, Father, despite all of our screw-ups. Thank you for desiring us and leading us into good places. I pray for the man or woman that's here today that was, um, that didn't raise their hand but wanted to, Father. I pray that you give them the courage to come speak to me, to come find out more about you and this relationship with you. We pray this in your matchless and wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Ella's going to come up and share about what we're going to do next. Thank you, Jeremy.